Pastor Loudermilk from the Way of the Cross Church. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about our services and our service time and invite you to come and worship with us. We have many wonderful programs in place that would be a blessing to your family, our children's program, our teenage program, and, and the Bible studies and the church services that are geared for each member of your family. Way of the Cross Church is located at 612 Beatrice Drive in Riverside, Ohio. Riverside is a small community between Dayton and Huber Heights. Beatrice Drive is a connector street between Brant Pike and Harshman Road. The church is located again at 612 Beatrice Drive. Our service times are as follows. Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., of course, our main service. We have service on Sunday evening at 6.30 and then our midweek Bible study for adults and teenagers and children of all ages is on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. I sincerely invite you to come and be part of these services, and God bless you as uh, you watch the program this evening. Stinking excited about First Advent. Sure, I enjoy it. Culturally, I love celebrating it. I love singing the carols. I love lighting the lights. I love wrapping the pre well. I love getting presents. <laughs> but I tell you what, King of Heaven, calm down. Second Advent is coming. Are you stinking excited about Second Advent? Come on, amen, hallelujah. Jesus will come again, Miss Rachel. Jesus will come. There is no doubt, just like there is absolutely no doubt in my mind, there's, there's no shadow of doubt at all that Almighty God, the good, good Father, desires for us to hear an angelic declaration today. He wants us like out in the field like the shepherds standing there and bow. He wants us to hear a voice today, His voice today. He wants us to hear a declaration today. Are your ears on? I got mine on. I got mine on. I need to hear a de declaration today. Oh, I tell you, glory to God in the highest heaven. Hear those angels singing in peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. He wants us to hear an angelic choir sing. But even more than a Gabriel moment... You remember those Gabriel moments, right? This is one of them. Even more than that, he wants us to hear his song. He wants us to hear his voice. He wants us to experience hope, capital H, right? Amen? He wants us to come face to face with the person of hope, capital H. Jesus, Jesus is hope. Hope is Jesus. Amen? Amen. With that as our starting point, <laughs> I'm going to respond to the shepherds with a resounding yes. And I'll give you an opportunity. If you want to join me, just get your, you know, your lips warmed up. The word is yes. That's all you need. That's pretty easy, right? You got it? That's your, that's your line. Yes. The shepherd said in Luke 2.15, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And I say, and you say with me, yes. yes, let's go. Come on, let's pack our bags and go on that adventure. Amen. Let's get into the story, become a part, because we are a part of this story. Read it again for the first time. I have heard it at least once a year every year of my life, and I'm not talking about what that is today, all right? That age. You could chuckle at that. It's okay. I got you all serious, and I'm going to relax you a little bit. I've heard that story every year of my life. I need to hear it again for the first time. I need to hear the hope again for the first time. I need to know it. I need it refreshed. I need that kind of hope. You see, the angelic choir's message continues to reverberate even today. 
And we so need a message of peace on earth, do we not? <laughs> when we lift our eyes to the glorious hope of Jesus, when we open our ears to the hope-filled story of God in the person of Jesus, when we strive to place each footstep in the footstep of our King of Hope, when we trust in the person of hope, that song, their song, that angelic song, ha, I could hear it. Hmm. You know, as, as I talked and prayed with someone last Sunday, to hear them tell me that they prayed a prayer of salvation the day before, I knew the angels swelled in heaven. Their voices picked up. They were singing in heaven. That song continues to sing. Every moment you see God, you allow yourself to wake up to His reality. Those angels are going, yes, they're getting it. They're excited. They're going to sing that song. You know what's even more incredible? Zephaniah 3.17 says <laughs> that God sings over us. Boy, I want that song. I want that song over my life. Am I alone? Please don't let me be alone. Let's, let's get together on this. Let's agree on this. This is our starting point. This moment, the person of hope. Hope with a capital H. Remember, it's as if God walked way across town to my poor pitiful door and knocked. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. He Actually, he didn't go across. He went down, 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 down to my door. He, he came to my poor wretched dwelling and he said, Hey, I want to know you. Why did he do that? Because I matter to him. He, he came to your door. <laughs> he did. In fact, he might be knocking right now this morning. Why? Because you matter to him. He wants to know you. He wants to get to know who you are. That is, that is the reason for Emmanuel. You do, re you do realize that. One of my friends and I were talking a couple days ago, and he was sharing something that his pastor shared with him last year because we were stirring each other up. We preach sermons at each other all the time. And he said to me, he goes, you know what my pastor said last year? He goes, at first I, like, I, I kind of resisted it, but then I got it. He said, you know, people say that Jesus is the reason for the season. And that was our, kind of our theme last year, but I, I said Jesus is the reason for every season. Do you remember that? Every season of life, right? He goes, the pastor, my friend was telling me, his pastor said, uh-uh. He goes, don't you get it? You're the reason for this season. I'm the reason for this season. The only reason why this story took place is because he loved me and wanted to know me. That is the only reason why Jesus stepped down, took upon himself the form of a man, even though he considered it fine and dandy to be God Almighty, he said, no, I'm going to set that aside. I am going to be what they are because I want to know them. And I want to reconcile them with dad. That's what I'm going to do. We are the reason for the season that's happening. Not necessarily Jesus. Jesus just gets everything going. <laughs> he is the start. He is the spark of hope. He is life. Thank you, dad. He is hope. Amen. Hallelujah. He wanted to be with us, so we made it happen. Emmanuel. He wanted to know us. Boom, there it was. Emmanuel. He just did it. He got it done. He should have, like, coined the Nike slogan because that's what he did. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he is the originator, the author, the finisher Amen. of the faith. Amen. Amen. So here we are in light of the Thessalonians in the middle of their mess, they're real people, people. <laughs> Riverside people, or Huber Heights people, or Daytonians, whoever we are. These Thessal Thessalonians were real people. And they had real problems, real persecution, real situations. And what was noted about them, you've heard me say this for three weeks now. Paul said, when I think about you, ha, I think about that enduring hope that you have because of Jesus Christ. That's what I want to be known for. Amen. 
I, I got to thinking about that months ago, and I thought, what in the world? What if I lived like that? <laughs> Melody, what if that's really what people saw about me? You know, they see a lot, trust me. <laughs> and I'm sure I show a lot, you know. When I'm not feeling good, you probably could see it all over my face. When I'm stressed and there's 50 people in line at the store and about half of them are getting upset with me, you could see it on my face, I'm sure. Although I'm saying, God bless you. Thank you for shopping at Family Christian. Thank you. Good Merry Christmas. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, I want people to know me. I want people to know you. I want people to know this church as a place, as people of hope. Amen? Amen. So we're challenged by them to find hope, to find Jesus. He desires to be found. And it is my desire, and I pray it's yours, to have God moments, not just Gabriel moments, but to dive into Scripture, find that connection, that moment of hope connection with God. And don't wait on flashing lights. Flashing lights are fine, and they're great, and they're dandy. And I love, you know, I love planned worship services, and I love overheads and videos, and I want my cues, and I want my cordless mic to work right. But I tell you what, I desperately need that all set aside. I need God moments. That's what I need. I need God face-to-face -face moments. Hallelujah. I need to find hope with a capital H. Thank you, Jesus. When I meet him, when I'm in his presence, he will bring to life every bit of potential that he put there in the first place. There is a ton of potential in this room. There is so much is crazy. They said that yesterday in Nutter Center. There's so much potential. We celebrate our outcomes, and you guys, the students, you are our outcomes. Listen, <laughs> Jesus is celebrating that incredible potential outcome of your life. He is so ecstatic to bring hope to you and to see what it does in you and your family. He's celebrating. He's celebrating that. He's singing over us today. Hallelujah. But in light of them, we're challenged. In light of the Thessalonians, we're challenged to have hope. Not just find it, but to have it. Don't bury it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. You know what I'm saying? People find hope and then they walk away from it or they pile their stuff on it. We need to have it. It needs to be pressed down, shaken together, running over, hope-filled kind of people. That's what we need to be. That's what we need to show. Hallelujah. Full on displayed, enduring hope because we have him. Because we make him king and we keep him king. You know what I'm saying? I don't know about you, but I've had to, to recite that little line, I would probably say dozens of times in the last two weeks, okay, that Jesus is born in Becky <laughs> in the reign of impatient customers or in the reign of just stress, in the reign of three and a half hours of sleep for five, six, seven days in a row. Jesus was born in me in the middle of my situation. He is born in me in the reign of whatever is trying to take his throne, and I'm going to let him have the throne. Can I get an amen on that? Can I have somebody join me in that? Praise you, God. Make him king. Keep him king. And last week, we talked about being challenged to know hope and to know Jesus. I am so ecstatic that he desires to make me wise. You know, he says in James, if I, if I lack it, wisdom that is, ask it, and he'll give it. Not just a little, not just enough to get by. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Helen, he gives me truckloads. <laughs> if I ask him for it, he will give it to me. And he's going to give it to you as well. Amen? Amen. When you know Jesus, he cultivates the richest commodity known to mankind within our lives, wisdom. He will use us in our clueless moments. Can I get a witness? Somebody, come on. I have lots of clueless moments. Remember, in case you weren't here last week, Mary and Joseph took that baby to the temple, and they were clueless. They were clueless. They didn't know what was going to happen in their lives. They had God in their hands. They had even had Gabriel moments, but they looked at 
at Simeon as if he was crazy, talking about how their son would clarify and make known the thoughts of men. Wow. They were clueless. But they were doing what they knew to be right. And that's what we need to do. When we really don't know what to do, we do what God has told us to do. We follow His words. He'll help us at our clueless moments. He'll use us in those moments. He'll use us in the satisfied heart moments, thank God, like Simeon. And He'll use the wisdom that He's churned up within us. I know, there's a ton of you. I mean, you could, I could probably try to come up with some situation, maybe that somebody in this room has never been through. But it, there's no way. All of you have been through so much, so much wisdom, because that's what those things come out of. Growth comes out of pain. It doesn't come out of anything else. That's about the only thing it comes out of. Growth comes out of struggle and pain. And that kind of wisdom is there. So when you reach that satisfied heart moment, you can speak into the hard things of other people's lives. And that's a great responsibility, isn't it, Pastor Steve? It's huge. But that's, what's God, that's what God has called us to be to one another, to walk in wisdom in such a way. And then you look at Anna, who, <laughs> the vocal woman, hallelujah, <laughs> she dedicated her voice to speak his story, not her history, but his story. And God will use that voice. So find, have, no hope. Because Jesus wants to be found. He does. He wants to be found. He has so much to fill us up with. And he wants to make us wise. So today, today, oh, oh, oh. oh goodness, here we go. You ready for the challenge today? This is the huge call to action in two little words. Be hope. Be. Make the choice today. Be hope. For He desires to use you. Yes, you, you. With all your junk. And with all your pretty stuff too. But He desires to use you, Amen. you, yes. Miss Linda, he does. He has used many of you time and time again. He wants to still use you and use you again. Be hope. Be hope. All this hope stuff is not for hoarding. No. All right? That should be a bumper sticker. Hope is not for hoarding. Yeah. I mean, that's a great message. Come on. Yeah. I think maybe I should trademark that. Hope is not for hoarding. It is that you don't get hope to keep it to yourself, do you? No. I'm going to push this thing over today because I mean this. The Spirit of God means this. I mean, he's, he's like pointing his finger at me. I'm not just trying to yell. Forgive me if I am. But hope is not for hoarding. Hope is not for keeping inward and for myself, for my own situation. It is for being on display and to give away, to share, to impart, to deposit, to do all those things that don't always come very natural. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us to be hope. I'm telling you, full on display, enduring hope for all the world to see and share in because it is, quote, Good news that will bring great joy to all people. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is that news? Now, we're going to read the exact verse here in just a minute. But if I can quote Mr. Blaine Bowman, I think this is kind of, he was being prophetic. I believe that. Absolutely being prophetic on 920 when he said this in this sanctuary. And I think it's almost like, if I could say this, I'm not sure if this is legal. But I think it's like a retranslation of the angel's message. Okay. All right? A little bit. I mean, part of it. He said, we will not tolerate hopelessness in this place. Amen. And I think that's what God and Jesus, when they got together, got the 
absurd plan of stepping down into our existence. That's what was going on. He's like, I am not tolerating hopelessness in this place. I am not in this building, in this person, in this city. I will not tolerate it in the name of hope, capital H, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, we'll read the real message here in just a second. But hope is here. You hear me? Hope is here. Heads up now. He used an angel choir in our adventure. He's not using that today. I'm looking at his voice today. God, help me. God, help you. I'm looking at his voice. He's not using an angel choir. He's using you. He's using me. We are the voice of hope. But it's only through the grace of Jesus. It's only because he made us right with God. It's only because he reconciled us to the Father. But we have to step up and be hope in this world. And that's a challenge. I feel like I'm bossing you around today. Shoo. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. We need it so bad. Our families need it. I know many of you will sit down with people on Friday maybe for dinner that need hope. Family members. Bad situations. Marriages broken. Sickness. Whatever it may be that's trying to take the throne, <laughs> step into that situation with a spirit of hope. Amen? Amen. 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 Can't see my notes. Good Lord. <laughs> be Jesus, or be hope, be Jesus, <laughs> for he desires to use you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So can we jump back into that illustration or the adventure? Not the illustration, the adventure, that first adventure, amen? We do have our hope lit up today. Is it lit up in your heart? Hallelujah. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1. At that time, bear with me, we're going to read this because I love this story. At that time. The Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the very first census taken with Quirinius was governor of Syria. So all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he, he just had to go to Bethlehem. <laughs> He had, to do, he had to go because a governor told him to not. He had to go because that's what God had ordained, and that was the prophecy. <laughs> Amen. David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him in snugly, wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Now that night, this is where the theme song kind of comes in again. Thank God we're not riding out on camels like the one day. Today we're just walking, moseying through the fields watching the animals, minding our own business, doing our job. Just doing our job. Just showing up, doing our job. But that night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them. And the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. Uh-huh. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this 
sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven. I'm not messing with these guys. But they were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. I want to be in that rank. Amen? When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And everybody said, yes, let's do it. (laughs) Here we go. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to work. They went back to their flocks. Ha! But they went with an attitude adjustment. Saying, I'm saying, I need that some days when I go back to work. Amen? (laughs) They went glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Amen. Amen. What an adventure. What an adventure. You know, signs are good. Signs are good. Absolutely. I love my Garmin. Just want everyone to know, I can't take a road trip without Garmin or some kind of navigation tool. Amen. How did we live before those? I mean, we had to stop at gas stations and ask for directions, right? (laughs) Or fold out the paper map, which, don't get me wrong, I love paper maps, too. But the Garmin, oh, I breathe a sigh of relief. Like a few weeks ago, I was in Chicago. Okay, I'm from Dayton. I drive in Dayton. I don't drive in Chicago, okay? But I had to drive in Chicago. (laughs) You know, I'm on one side of the highway. We're all going the same direction, and there's eight lanes, you know. Which one am I supposed to be in and when? (laughs) You know, I'm freaking out a little bit. But I was actually better because I looked over at my friend Garmin. Garmin says, Becky, you need to be in the second to the right-hand lane because it's highlighted for me. I'm like, ooh, okay, zip, here I am. I love signs. I love direction. Isn't it nice? I mean, think about about the guys, you know, when they close a road, or not close it, but they, like, narrow it down to just one lane. But it's a two-lane road, you know. It's two-way traffic. So they have one guy on one side, and they have one guy on the other. And they have a sign, and it flips back and forth. One side says stop, right? Yeah. 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 Some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And the other side says slow. You know, and they talk to each other, or they watch each other, which really scares me sometimes. (laughs) I hope they're fresh and they've had their coffee. (laughs) And they flip the sign back and forth so this side can go, and then this side stops, and this side can go, and that side stops. You know, it's good to have signs. It's good to have direction one time. Can't trust in every sign, though. That's a challenge. One time I was driving in New York City. Yeah. Uh And Garmin thought it would try to think better because there was stop traffic. And said, I'm going to take you a different route. I ended up down in the Bronx around 5 o'clock in rush hour, me and Debbie, yeah, I, it, was, it was interesting because there were so many people in cars. It was, I was a little scared because I had Ohio plates, you know. <laughs> you just know something's going to happen. But signs are good. Signs are good. Signs help us. Anybody ever heard of Bill Ingevall? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that group of comedians, one of them, of course, Jeff Foxworthy is, you might be a redneck if, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bill Ingvall's kind of famous line is, here's your sign. Here's your sign. You know, he, he's a proponent for everyone wearing a sign if they're stupid. So he knows how to avoid them. He goes, oh, okay, I'll avoid that one. <laughs> yeah. I would be wearing the stupid sign about every other day, I think, because that's just how it rolls with me. But signs are good. Signs are good. We have one in this passage. We have. I mean, we know that verse 12 is a sign. We do. First of all, it says it is. That's a rocket science, isn't it? 
How do you like that? I went to Bible college for that one. <laughs> I even pulled out a commentary and figured that out, right? It says that it's a sign. Secondly, it's a sign because it points me in the direction. It gives me inspiration for being hope. For being Jesus. Because I know He wants to use me. We look at that little verse. Can we unpack it together? And you will recognize Him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. I know the you in this passage literally is the shepherds, okay? But I'm in this story, all right? You are in this story too, right? Yes. Amen. So you. You, you. you. Yeah. Not the other person, but you. Yeah. You. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. This verse is talking to you. It's talking to me. Personalize the Word of God. Let it speak to your heart. It's an invitation that you will. You will. That's saying, come on Kyle, join me in this story. It's an invitation to jump into hope. To learn and kind of soak it in and grab a hold of it and be the hope that people need to see. You Next couple words, we'll find. Ooh, I like that. God's promised. If we seek Him, we will find Him. That's a promise. You can take it to the bank. And it's talking to you. You. You will find. You will find. Hallelujah. What are you going to find? Absurdity. You're going to find a baby. <laughs> Hello? I thought I was going to find like the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Messiah. Someone to take over the Roman Empire. Free us. No, you're going to find a baby. Hope arrives often in the most absurd ways. <laughs> because God kind of plans like that. I, I don't exactly know why. But... I can also see in this context, in the adventure of, of the nativity, that hope arrives in the most unassuming, in the most understandable, in the most relatable, the most unthreatening, the most accessible way possible. Because you know what? Every one of us have been a baby. Every one of us have been there, including our Savior. So God's plan may be absurd, but God will choose the best recourse to reach you the deepest. Just open your heart to Him. Just open your heart to Him. So you will find a baby wrapped. Wrapped, as I chuckled earlier, I don't like wrapping presents. It's kind of a chore to me. There are people, Debbie Evans loves wrapping presents. I have other people raising their hand. It's like an art form. <laughs> it amazing. And there must be bows on everything. Everything. Me, I'm like, okay, where is the least creased bag that I can reuse? You know, that's how I work. <laughs> Give me that crinkled tissue paper. <laughs> Can I wrap this in newspaper? Is that okay? Oh, wait a minute. I don't even have any newspapers. <laughs> Can I just give it in a Kroger bag or a Kmart bag? <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> but wrapping to some people is an art form. And you know, to God, it definitely is. Yes. It definitely is. Because you know what hope does in our lives? It wraps itself around us. Usually when we absolutely need it the most desperately, it just wraps around us. Warm and tight and snug and, oh, the arms of Jesus. Hope, capital H. The message of hope has a natural way of surrounding us, wrapping us, if you will, in his presence. 
double entendre intended. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In his presence. His present of Jesus, the present of our lives back to him, his presence as in him being present. Oh, how beautiful. How beautiful. So you will find a baby wrapped in snugly. I always think of the... Um, the laundry commercial. Isn't the little bear named Snuggles? Yeah. And how fresh and smelling, and you know, he's bouncing on the towels. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, okay, okay. good. I got, I got some head shakes on that. I don't think the smell was very fresh this night. <laughs> yeah, probably not. No, 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 no. I mean, we kind of think of a barn, but it probably was more like a cave. And it had more than likely centuries of sheep herding going on in it. You follow me? Yeah, Pastor Steve understands. <laughs> I mean, I, it, these strips of cloth, whatever they were, maybe it was Joseph's robe. I don't know. Maybe it was some old blanket that was left and, you know, it's there, let's use it. Maybe it was Mary's tunic. Whatever it was, snugly strips of cloth. You know, Hope, capital H, says in Luke 4, he quotes about himself from Isaiah 61. He says, I have come to bind up the brokenhearted. Being hope is a clear effort to wrap the message of love around the broken lives of people. Grab a hold whatever snuggly piece of cloth you can find in a spiritual sense and wrap it around each other. Snug it up. Bind each other up. That's what we're called to do. To be hope. To be hope. Mm. People are what matter to him. He wanted to know me. He wanted to know you. That's why he's here. That's why we have the sign. You know, I, at the risk of, because I, you know, I don't know every verse in the Bible by heart. So at the risk of misspeaking, I'll say this because I, I think I'm right. And he'll correct me if I'm not, so don't fear. I don't think there is ever a place in the Bible where I'm told to tell people they're going to hell. It's not my job. The Holy Spirit is the convictor. He is the one that brings to light sin. That's his job. You know what my job is? Woo! My job is to wrap people in snuggly pieces of cloth. My job is to love people. To love God and to love my neighbor as myself. As I love myself. Wow. Wow. My job is to be hope, to be Jesus. Amen. So you will find a baby wrapped in snugly strips of cloth, lying, laying down. Now when I think of laying down, I think of, oh, I just worked 16 hours and I want to hit the hay. <laughs> I want to go to sleep. <laughs> I want to lay down my burden down by the riverside. I want to rest. But when, in, when I look at this sign, you know what it speaks of? It's surrender. You will find a baby wrapped in snuggly cloths, strips of cloth, that absolutely thought it was not robbery to be equal with God, but he took upon himself the form of man and he laid down in a manger. He surrendered his will to God Almighty. That's the sign. Do you have any idea what God could do with a surrendered life? Jason? <laughs> God, I, I watch you run your race, and I know God could do amazing things, Lori, with a surrendered life. God can take what you lay down, the mess that it is, <laughs> and I have a big one sometimes, He could take that 
and use it beyond compare. In fact, speaking of messes, you will find a baby wrapped in snuggly strips of cloth lying in a manger. In a manger. In a feed trough. In a nasty old piece of wood designed for something totally different. And this is what it speaks to me. God can use anything He absolutely wants to for any purpose He wants to, period. And that includes your mess. That includes your feed trough. You know what I'm saying? He can use anything. He can use the damaged moments of my life to help me get to a place of satisfaction. And then I take that wisdom that's drawn from that damaged moment in life and I can be hope and speak it into somebody else's life. That's what He does. He mixes that up so well. That's what He does. He can use the feed trough. He can use me. He can use you. He wants to use you to be hope. Praise God. Hallelujah. Speaking of glory and speaking of pleasing God, because that's what verse... 13 says, suddenly the angel, after the sign was given, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Let me close by reading one final scripture in Romans. Romans chapter 5, it says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight, we're one of those people that's pleasing Him. That's kind of cool. That's where I want to be. By faith, we have peace with God because, it wasn't what I did, but it was because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems. And trial. There's that absurd process of God again. Okay. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know, this is the absurdity that turns into beauty. We know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident, if I may be so bold to insert, enduring hope of salvation. And this hope will not, absolutely not, lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Verse 11, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. Are there any friends of God in the room? Friends of God? Listen. Back to verse 2 at the very end. We now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Yes, I know that's talking about futuristic, second advent, glory in heaven kind of glory. But it also means that we have the confidence to stand in this crazy world and share glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill toward men, goodwill toward those who please Him. Please come and know this Jesus. Look at my life. See the reflection of hope in my life. Please understand. Oh, that's scary, guys. When I realize that I'm the first lineup, <laughs> I am, I'm the first way that people, I may be the only Jesus they see. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to get to. I'm the first wave of that. They haven't really got to this yet, this wonderful, divine, perfect word of God. They may just be seeing it in me. But I have confidence, and I can stand, and I can do that. Because God has asked me 
God is challenging me to be hope to the world. Amen? So where is your sign? The kids are getting ready to come in. I hear them. Woo, there's life in the church. Glory to God. Miss Fayreen, you get ready. Where's your sign, people? Here's this feed trough. Ours is probably nicer. Nicer than the one Jesus was put in. But where's your sign? It should be quite this bold. You know what I'm saying? It should feel like it's hanging around your neck, but it ain't going to be heavy, people. It, it's going to be a light burden. Because when you're reflecting the hope of Jesus, wow, he shows up. In my feed trough, in the snuggly strips of cloth, you know, whatever it is, whatever mess I've got going on, he's there. And he's going to take that reflection and bless it with his spirit. Because it is not by my might. Yes. And it's not by my power. And the force is with me. Amen. And it's the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. 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 To be hope. To people. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can you give Jesus a clap offering today? Amen.